speaker today, Laurel Pinto. So Laurel is an assistant professor uh, in the School of Computer Science at uh, NYU. Uh, so he received his master's and his PhD uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, working with uh, Avinav Gupta. Uh, prior to that, he did a bachelor's at the Indian Institute of Technology and spent a year uh, also as a postdoc at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, so Laurel's research is on uh, making general purpose robots, uh, robots that can adapt to new scenarios. Uh, and that we learn from humans, and I think uh, this group probably has the most, some of the most impressive uh, demonstrations of uh, using imitation learning uh, in the context of robotic manipulation, and yeah, I'm excited to, to learn more about that work today. Uh, he's also received a number of awards for his research, including Best Paper Award for all the kind of major uh, robotics conferences, RSS, ICRA, uh, Coral, IROS, uh, and a number of faculty uh, research awards as well from Google, Amazon, uh, and many others. Uh, yeah, well, thanks so much for taking the time to visit. Uh, we're super excited to have you here. Thank you so much for the really nice introduction. I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time in Princeton. Uh, so in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a few lessons that we have learned while trying to build a general purpose uh, robotic system. And I hope that will be helpful for you when you are building your own. Um, so to start off, let me just show you this video. So this is a task which humans can do quite easily, right? It's opening a solar panel. And we can do this in a few seconds. But if you think about it from a robotics standpoint, it's extremely hard. You first acquire the object, grasp it, you know, pry the tab open using your index finger, apply just the right amount of force so that you don't spill the drink. Right? And we do all of this in like a second. But what I think is even more impressive is that we can do a lot of these um, interactions in environments that we have probably never seen before. So here is a clip from one of my favorite movies from last year. Uh, it's Pinocchio. It's on uh, on Netflix, and it's a stop motion animation movie. So this means that every single frame in this movie was created by a human puppeteer, moving everything in the scene. And you take a picture, and then you stack them together, and it creates this beautiful uh, visual experience. So while I I was watching this movie, it's like, oh, it's a beautiful movie. But at the same time, you realize how far we are from robots to what humans can do using their hands. Right? So, you know, as I'm watching this movie, I'm like, oh, we're still trying to do like grasping and pick and place where humans can do all of this. Okay, so at the same time, as I'm like sadly thinking about the state of robotics, you just look at your colleagues doing NLP and you're like, wow, like they are, you know, they're creating these amazing chatbots where you feed in questions related to robotics, like what are the important problems in robotics, and it tells you things that I fairly agree with, you know, reliability, safety, autonomy, human-robot interaction, and a bunch of things. And it's not just in language. Even if you go in uh, into into vision, you feed in a prompt like this sort, and you can get these amazing pictures. Right? This is an image from from a neural network model. Pretty amazing, right? Okay, so, so after seeing all of this, the question is, we have all of these amazing models in language and in vision. What will it take to build amazing models in robotics? Okay, so before we do this, let's look at, let's take a step back and look at how, how do we create a robot model. Okay, so I'm going to categorize things in three ways. The first way is a nativist approach. We try to bake in as much information as we know about the world into the robot. So this can be in the form of a friction model, it can be in the form of a contact model or dynamics models, or it can be in the form of letting the robot know where everything is, where the tables are, the chairs are. It's something that you do if you do like task and motion planning. Uh, you need all this information. Okay, and this type of approach where humans try to bake in as much information programmatically into the system is what's worked really well. Right. So if you're seeing these amazing Boston dynamics robots doing a backflip, or you see this open AI hand solving the Rubik's Cube, all of this has relied on knowing a lot about the world, knowing where exactly all the steps are, knowing um, all the physics of this, of the hand and the object. And so this works quite well, so the question is, what's the problem? You know, if we have solved this, what are we doing as robotics? And the answer is that all of this requires really large teams, because you need to model all of this, you need to you know, optimize the solutions, make sure the solution works. If the solution does not work, you go back, you, know, you move things in the world, you change your simulation. You know, it's, it's a really uh, hard process and makes it really hard to, to optimize a robot. Okay, 
So in contrast to this, there's another school of thought, which is instead of trying to specify everything, you just do a tabula rasa approach, where you give the system as much of data, and then you ask the robot to learn from this data. Right? So you specify the data, train large models on this data, deploy these models. If something goes wrong, or if it's not doing what you want it to do, you, you get more data and retrain the system. So if you have done like reinforcement learning, for instance, this is what the learning mechanism is. Um, and this is exactly what we did, uh, like randomly interact with objects on the table, uh, and then from the success and failures, learn how to grasp objects. Uh, and now if you have even more data, for example, in Google's ARM farm, you can get orders of magnitude more data, you get much higher performance. Okay, so why not just go with this approach? Well, the problem over here is, how, like these approaches have never scaled beyond doing simple pick and place. Right? It's always doing pick and place, and even like, I don't know, eight years later, uh, if, you, if you still look at these learning from scratch approaches, they always are, you know, we haven't seen much advances beyond this. So why is this the case? Well, let's look at inspiration from natural language. So here is a plot from the scaling loss paper from OpenAI. And on the x-axis is the size of data set, y-axis is loss, so high is bad. Uh, and what you see is that when you increase the data set size by an order of magnitude, you get a linear reduction in loss. But the thing to note is this size is 10 to the power of 9 in terms of tokens. Right? So you can do this when you are in language, but in robotics, what I'm doing over here in a very hand baby way is I'm plotting where robotics is in terms of its data. Right? So if you just like you know take this trend and sort of extrapolate on the lower side, you will see that this is this is not good. Okay, so so what should we do, right? A nativist approach, it, it may not work in scenarios which are new. A tabula, a tabula rasa approach may not work if you do not have enough data. So I think the way to do things is how this cat learns how to open this door. Okay, so this cat is trying to open the door and the cat's owner is like, you know, inspiring it to open the door. Maybe like showing it how to open the The cat tries, the cat tries, okay. At some point it figures it out, right? And once it's figured it out, it gets the door. And now anytime you want it to open the door, it can open the door. Right? So this is a sort of learning mechanism I want, where where you have this thing where you have data, you have a model, but you have some sort of humans in the loop. You know, either showing you how to do it or giving you some sort of reward or some sort of signal or guidance in terms of solving. So I'm going I'm to call this a constructivist approach inspired from how humans learn in classes. Um, and yeah, so, so a lot of the work I'm going to talk about are going to fall in this realm where you have, you have data, you have learning, and you have humans. Now, of course, this is not a new idea. There are people from the 1980s, like the Sarkissons group, were doing this for a, for a very long time. And even more recently, there are works from a bunch of different groups, uh, most prominently work from Google, which also uses, uses this principle of trying to get a lot of human data and learning from it. OK, so in contrast to this, what I've been talking today is going to have two key ingredients. The first key ingredient is that we're going to look at actually textual systems. So systems like multi-fingered hands, where you want to make multiple contacts with the world. So it's not just like we can place like operations. And the second thing is we're going to try to go to environments that the robot has not seen before. So we want to evaluate our systems in setups where maybe you haven't even seen training data. Okay, so maybe not as complicated as this as this, but two words this time. Alright, so with that. Let's look at this hand. So this is a Allegro robot hand. It has four fingers, 16 degrees of freedom, um, and we want to uh, we want to now get high quality data from this hand. So how do we do that? So the first setup, which is normally used, is something called a cyber glove. This is a glove you wear, and as you move the glove, the robot moves along with you. And it works quite well, but the problem is that the glove is super expensive. And every time you have to use it for a new user, you have to be calibrated because everyone's hands are different, the way you move is not going to transfer the same way onto this robot. So instead of this, there are some more modern solutions where you can use vision 
and take pose estimators on human hands, find the pose, and transfer those pose onto the, onto the hand. Now this works well, it's really cheap, but the problem is that it is inaccurate because from a single view, hand pose estimates are not that good. Okay. So we have one approach which is expensive and accurate, one approach which is cheap but inaccurate. Is there a way to get a best of both worlds? And um, at the same time as we're trying to answer this question, uh, we saw that there are these amazing VR headsets, uh, thanks to Zuck and Meta, where they have really good hand pose estimates in them. So the reason they have really good hand, hand pose estimates is that you see these like these black dots. These black dots are um, are cameras. So there are four cameras on the setup, so you get four views of the hand. And then they have you know spent I don't know millions of dollars training really good hand pose estimators inside VR. So these hand pose estimators, they are, they are run on board on the system. So I don't need any extra hardware for that. Okay, so let me show you a demo which you can probably run like off the, uh, off the shelf. So here is a human, they're wearing this, this uh, Oculus headset. Uh, what you're seeing on screen over here is what this human is seeing uh, in their headset. So they're seeing the hand pose estimates which is in this black mesh over here. And as they move it, I am in real time retargeting them onto a robot. So as they're moving the hand, they're, they're, they're seeing how the robot hand is moving, and now they are, they're effectively controlling the robot using their hand as a high dimensional joystick. Because your hand has many degrees of freedom. Yeah. Quick question, so in the previous slide, there were these other hand tools that, I'm not super familiar with all the decks, but it seems like you have to hold them, but in this case, he's not holding anything. Yeah, so so in, in in all of these previous things as well, you we never hold the object. Uh, so so even even the even with this guy, you're still using the hand as a joystick. You still so the, the holding part it doesn't work well yet because there's no way to to convert the forces. Mm -hmm. So if you want to convert the forces, you have to create an exoskeleton of sorts. Put your hand inside that exoskeleton, and then when you make a, a contact interaction, you transfer those forces onto your hand. So, so, so there are ways of doing that. Uh, it's just that they are super expensive. Gotcha. And it, but I also meant the um, those extra components of the holodeck system. It looks like yeah. there is a three piece. Uh, so uh, this thing. The or next, sorry, the next slide. Uh, yeah, the two. Oh, we just ignore these two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you just like wear that. Yeah, and you just use your hands, and uh -huh. you can just like keep that in the box. You don't you don't have to hold this anywhere. So that's oh I, I thought that was like a core part of the state estimation. Oh no, no, it's not. It's not used at all. Yeah. Uh, now of course, if you're trying to control just the end effector of two arms, you would want to use this because the pose estimates from this is really accurate. For the hands, because you know hand trackers do have inaccuracy, so you cannot do anything like millimeter level control using this. Right? So like using the using the hand pose estimates. So, but maybe with these dongles, you can get much, much improvement to this. All right, okay, so now since we have a framework to, to move this hand, uh, what we did is we have a bunch of tasks. On the left-hand side, there's a planar rotation task, uh, and then we go to harder and harder tasks. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a card slide and pickup, which is quite hard to do, actually really hard to tell the operator as well. Um, and now across all of these tasks, what we do is we evaluate how well our system uh, our system does versus a single image uh, sort of setup. And so what we see is that on the easy tasks, which are the ones uh, on the first the first third tasks, the first three tasks, uh, on these ones we get roughly a 2x improvement in speed. And on the next ones, the, the harder ones, you cannot solve them using a single image because you need really good estimates of depth for them. So if you want to solve hard tasks, uh, you, you, you're just not able to do this with a single image framework. You really need something which can give you accurate 3D pool estimates. <coughs> okay, so so now I have a framework where I can get a bunch of uh, a bunch of demonstrations of solving stuff, solving problems using the hand. Um, and for each of these tasks, I collect one hour of data. Right. So I ask the student to like you know try to solve this task and spend one hour on it. I have one hour of data for each of these tasks. So now the question is, I have this data, what can I do with this data? How can I optimize a policy uh, or you know, some sort of a controller which can run on this hand? All right, so let me go over one of the most easiest ways of training a policy, which is called uh, 
TV request. So over here, what you do is you have a neural network. The input into the neural network is an observation, and the output is an action. So on the observation side, we are going to feed it images. So there's a camera, it has an RGB image. We are feeding it only a single RGB image into this, into this neural network. The output is action. Because we have a hand, what we're going to do is, instead of doing joint level control, we are going to control the fingertips of this hand. Right? So we have uh, four fingers, so that's 12, 12 dimensional action space at the output. So now we are training EHB cloning. The way you do it is you find uh, the, the, the loss for the specific input, you train it, and we train this, and we get a success rate of 0%. Mm -hmm. So it just completely fails. Right? And the reason it fails is quite intuitive. You, know, you have a large neural network, so many weights, so many parameters inside it. It's surely, like in training time, it completely overfits. And then when we evaluate, even for the slight, for the slightest errors, it completely goes over D and fails. Right? And so the key over here to fix this problem is to try to get more from this data than what supervised learning is able to do. So the key is to use something called self-supervised learning. I won't go into the details here, but I'll give you the high-level flavor of what's happening. OK, so the strategy is as follows. You take all of your data. Yeah. Sorry, quick clarification question. Um, so the robot hand only has four fingers. Is your behavior cloning basically just throwing away the pinky from the human, or are you doing something a bit more elaborate to go from five fingers to four? Yeah, this is a great question. So we have tried a bunch of things, but what's happening over here is we completely remove the pinky. Off the student? No. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm assuming if the student uses it often enough, they may they may you know start to lose uh, you know they. So, so after you use this framework, the way you move in the world changes because the 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 Oculus has a weird like warp in it. So like once you remove it, you like see the world slightly differently. So so who knows? Maybe if you use it enough, maybe. Um, so we have actually tried a few things. So um, one of the things which I've found hard to do is on the ring finger. It's hard to control all degrees of freedom. So. Uh, the way this Allegro works is that its joints are not aligned the same. So the kinematic chain of the fingers here on the robot, it does not match the human kinematic chain. For example, we can do this. The Allegro hand is not able to do that. Instead, on the Allegro hand, the fingers sort of rotate this way. Uh, and so we have tried to use the pinky as a way to control this like other degrees of uh, it works well if the person has a lot of time inside the framework. But if you give it to a new user, they will be completely lost. They will not know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in our in our framework, what we do is we just take all the observations without any action information, and we do something called self-supervised learning, where the idea is more like a sort of like a, a denoising auto encoder, right? So we 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 take the images, we Corrupt it with some sort of noise, and then we force the encoder to have the same same uh, same representation from the noise and the and the no noise. Right? So the, the 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 specific algorithm we use here is called um, BYOL, but you can use any state of the art SSL algorithm, and it should still work reasonably well. Okay. So at the end of the day, what this encoder training is giving you takes in a high dimensional image, outputs a low dimensional feature or representation of what it's seeing there. Okay. Now, if your feature is good enough, what you can do is something really stupid simple. So let's say now I have a robot with maybe a new object. I feed it to an encoder. I get a representation. And now, with this representation, I look at all the data I have ever collected. I find the nearest neighbor. And I literally just apply the action of the nearest neighbor on the robot. Right? It's so simple, like even a high schooler doing machine learning should be able to code it up. Right? Super simple algorithm. And uh, just again, the key idea is to get low dimensional features, you do self supervised learning. And once you have that, just do nearest neighbors um, to get action. OK, so here, is, here are some of the policies in action. So this is planar rotation. So you put an object, and it can rotate it uh, in the plane of the hand. Here is flipping, where it sort of is able to rotate it 
outside the plane of the hand. Now, if you can do both the, uh, both the rotation task and the flipping task, you can now move this object to any orientation as a combination of these two things. Okay, so here are like more tasks. This is a can spinning task. You put a can. It's supposed to spin it without uh, without being able to drop it. And then we have more videos for all the other tasks. I won't show them in the interest of time. But what I want to go over is something which I think is more interesting, which is the generalization ability of um, of these policies. Okay, so let's say for for the planar rotation, I showed it how to rotate the object with this object, right? And now with the same policy, without any additional training, I can put in arbitrary objects. There are some objects from the YCB data set, if you recognize the ones on the diagonal. And there are some other like 3D printed objects which we have over here. And what we see is that for most of these objects, it's able, uh, able to rotate it. The funny thing is that you may you may think that, OK, it's just an open loop strategy, right? But if you look at the behaviors, for some, for some objects, it uses the ring finger. For some, it uses the middle finger. It always has to use the thumb, because you need to have uh, an opposable thumb over here. Uh, but it's not like just running an open loop policy. Now this works for like other tasks as well. Again, we're not we're not doing any anything uh, additional over here. We train the object on uh, we train the policy on the left, and on the right we see that it, it automatically works on a bunch of different objects. Here's the here's the the can spinning example. I showed how to spin a Pringles can, and now it can automatically uh, start start doing a 90 degree spin of a, of a bunch of other can like objects. Okay. Now another thing I really like about these nearest neighbor algorithms is that you can actually probe into it and see what it's doing to some extent. Um, so for example, let's say I have instead of my square object or my cube, cube object, I now put a triangular object. And, and so over here, I'm doing a rollout of the policy at the same time, I'm visualizing my nearest neighbor on the top right. So when something fails, I can actually look and see what the nearest neighbor was and see why it was failing. Right? Giving me some way of trying to improve the system because if I change my representations, I can see how my nearest neighbors are changing and then keep improving the system. Now this works on a, on a bunch of different tasks. The one on the right is the flipping task, and the one on the bottom is the can spinning task. Sort of see that you know the the edges are sort of aligned of the object as it spins it. All right. So uh, all of our code, data, and stuff is all public. If you want to use it, there's a link over here. And this is the first lesson which I'm going to offer you, which is interfacing is critical, whether you're doing imitation learning or not. Uh, what we have seen is that. Um, uh, anytime we have a problem we cannot solve, and you have two options, either improve the hardware system or create a new learning algorithm, uh, you should first start with improving the system. Uh, uh, and, and there are multiple reasons for that. You may think that, oh, you know, you get higher quality data. But I think it also improves your intuition of the robotic system the more you play around with it. And so at least from, from what we have seen, every time we improve our interfacing, we're always able to improve performance even with very simple learning algorithms. I have a question about the, yeah. the self-supervised learning part. Yeah. Is it operating, is it doing it only on images, or is there some like, temporal aspect to it that you can predict? Uh, yeah. Like future images or do some sort of convalescent learning? Yeah. Like where close to this point in time? Yeah, so this is, this is a great question. Over here, we are just doing it without any temporal information, just pure, pure images. Now, there are some newer works that we start using information of time, uh, and we do see improvements over there. In general, you can, you can try out a bunch of different, bunch of different um, SSL algorithms, and it works well. Like, as long as you can bring this high dimensional thing into something low dimensional, even though it's not exactly state, <coughs> it's, still, it's still fine. Um, yeah, so we have tried uh, contrastive methods quite a bit. And we find them to be very unstable, because if you don't uh, manage the number of negatives to positives, it, it becomes hard. So when you're, when you're trying to run this across many tasks, we find that the hyperparameters of the ratio of negatives and positives change per task, which makes it sort of less ideal. So I think our choice of using EYOL is not because it's the best algorithm, but it's the most, at least from our experience, it's the most stable across tasks. So if you had one task and you and you run a sweep on 
uh, on the SSL algorithms. I'm sure you'll find one which is much better than this. Could you give a brief example of why, like an example where interfacing of something you improved with the hardware system? Yeah, so this, so so over here, you will notice that the arm, uh, arm is stationary, only the hand is moving. So we have a new setup which, where like everything is moving. So the arm, <coughs> the hand moves, everything is moving. And uh, what we saw is that for some people, they like the robot to reflect what they do. So when you move this way, you want the robot to also move this way. But in some other axis, you don't want it to, uh, you don't want it to reflect. At least that's like a, it's like a human, human way of trying to control it. Right. Uh, and so uh, we have the system where, where based on the use that you can switch modes of how you want to control it, and that makes it so much easier for the humans in the lab to actually control this. That is maybe one recent example. Yeah. Uh, so does this uh, bureau policy depends on the historical information and also how to testify that it's indeed uh, the application cost objects instead of uh, just memorizing the information signals? So what you can do is you can just run open loop actions. So I'm going to answer your second question first. So you can just uh, run the open loop actions from from the first uh, from the first match, and you and you see that it fails. It fails more. So 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 that's an easy way to check it out. Uh, what was the first question again? I uh, this is where policy uses uh, historical information. Is it using what information? Like the stack historical. No. So there's no there's no stack information. Uh, in the observation side. Now, now there are a few tricks over here. So when we do the nearest neighbor thing, something which will happen very often is when you're controlling the robot, you may go into loops, like you may maybe open and then close. And whenever you do something of this sort, you have a loop. So if you don't have information of time and you just do nearest neighbor, it will start just going back and forth. It will just be stuck in the scope. So you have to have a loop, loop uh, breaking condition. So you you just Check if there's a loop. If there's a loop, stop taking that nearest neighbor. So we have something of that sort, which does something very similar to accounting for the temporal information. Yes. So I've noticed if, you, if the human is writing and you move your index finger off the pencil, it still moves because mm -hmm. your muscle memory, I guess. Yeah. So I'm curious, and I, I noticed a lot of times, or sometimes the fingers that are not in contact are wiggly. Yeah. And I wonder, is this like a relic from how humans are wiggling yeah. their fingers? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of our experiments over here, the people, so, so because this is operating with just one hour of data, it's not like the person has trained with the system for like days, right? So, so they still have a lot of human, human capabilities, which we hope they still have after using our system. Um, and, so, and so you will see that the way they, they operate objects is going to be different. Now I think there is like a shift in how you process these images. So when you start, you actually reason about your hand, and you're like, oh, this is how my hand is moving. But over time, you, st you stop looking at the pose estimates of your hand. You only look at what the robot is doing. Right? So I think that shift of trying to focus on the robot instead of focusing on your hand is when you start like actually being able to, uh, to control the robot very well. Right? At least that's what we have seen. Right. I can take more questions at the end. Uh, so we can go on to lesson number two. All right. So uh, there was a question about uh, in the crowd about uh, vision, and so a lot of our, our policies so far are taking vision as a need, right? So it's a vision-only policy. And the question of is vision enough, right? If you want to solve these really hard problems, uh, you know, should we only deal with vision? And to sort of prove no, here is a fun video I found yesterday. So it's like making uh, making a pot, and of course, if you are doing this, you do this without a lot of vision. For example, uh, this person's hand is literally inside this inside this mold, and so you cannot see visual inputs of what of, of what you're doing as your hand is inside it. Uh, you need to know about forces. You need to know about texture. Vision is clearly not enough. For you. And there's sort of neuroscience um, evidence for this as well. So if you look at the density of um, of uh, sort of so nerve, uh, tactile nerve density, you'll see that you have very high density on your fingertips. It's like 250 um, per centimeter square. So it's like crazy high density on your fingertips. Uh, and apart from your, it's interesting, because apart from your hands, the next highest is on your face. Good. But yeah, so, so now, okay, we want to, we want to uh, have more tactile sensing on our hands. 
how do we get a tactile sensor on the hand? Well, you spend a lot of money and you get this hand which has a bunch of tactile sensors all over uh, its fingers and its fingertips. So over here, what I'm showing you is this hand. Through the holodex framework, it's, uh, it's uh, trying, to, trying to pick up this yellow cup from, from the brown cup. And as it's doing it, on the right hand side, I'm showing you the tactile data. So each square over here, it represents one tactile pad uh, on, on the finger. And each of the tact cells in it, it gives you X, Y, Z information. Right? So this is fairly high dimensional tactile information, uh, which is coming from my hand. Okay. So, so with this framework, we can now also get a bunch of tactile data. But the problem with tactile is that unlike vision, we do not really know what's the best way to use tactile. Right? Like, should it be in the form of an image? What should the architectures be? Like, we haven't really done as much research in, tech, um, in tactile as we have done in vision and other forms of sensing. So the first thing we do is that you know, we take the hand and we just ask ask the first author of this paper to just play around with a bunch of different objects. So, so here, what they're doing is they are using the holodex framework and just manipulating a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different objects. Now, as we're doing this, they're recording both uh, the vision part of things, which you're seeing over here, but we also record all the tactile information. So, what we actually care about is this tactile information of all the uh, all the sensor readings as this hand is interacting with these objects. Okay, so now from all of these readings, we can now pre-train a self-supervised learning algorithm. So it's the same self-supervised learning thing which I showed you uh, on the vision side. Now we're going to do it on the tactile side, and we're just going to use this with the nearest neighbors. Same algorithm as this. Okay, so now we have again just to go over the tasks. We have a bunch of tasks from left to right is easy to hard. And we experiment a bunch of different things. We look at what happens if you use uh, torque information. So you can either take torque from the joints or you can use this tactile sensor. Uh, we also look at what happens if you use image only data, what happens if you use only tactile without image. And finally, on the rightmost column, it's what if you do this nearest neighbors with both vision features and tactile features while giving equal importance to both. And we see that. Uh, that often works the best across uh, across a bunch of tasks. Okay. Now again, at least to me, the most fun experiment is you train a policy on one object. So this is the uh, the cup and stacking problem, where there's a smaller cup inside a bigger cup, and you're supposed to sort of pry one cup from the bigger one. And we take the same policy and we run it on a bunch of other. Uh, other combinations. And these tests are done with this configuration being randomized on this black box. So it's not always starting in the same position. Um, and you'll see that in some cases it fails, like the ones on the left side. And on some cases it works on the right side. Overall, you get roughly close to 50%. Over here. Now here's again an example of the bowl and stacking task. Uh, so, so this is a weird task because for this for this one object, it actually works quite well. You get high success rate over here. But on the right hand side, when you change when you change the objects, um, its performance actually is not that high. So on some objects, you do get high performance. But for for many other objects, you you you, you get uh, less than fifty percent. Okay. So again, if you're interested in using uh, tactile sensing plus vision sensing. Uh, we have a lot of our, uh, like all of our models, all of our data online, so feel free, feel free to use it. And this brings me to my second lesson, which is we need to embrace multimodality. Our robots will have access to many different forms uh, of sensory inputs, and we need to really think about how to combine them. Over here, we're using the most simple, simple way of trying to combine them. You just take two features, you match them, and, and you give equal data. But they, they, there has to be a better way of doing this. Uh, okay, so any questions at this point? All right, so I'll move forward. Okay, so up to now I've been showing you things on hands, and I've been saying, oh, you know, we have this hand, we have all this vision and tactile, and things work well here. And an obvious question is, okay, I don't work on hands, let's say you don't work on hands, uh, how can I use this on my task? Okay, so, uh, so actually a lot of these algorithms were first developed not on hands, but on these two-fingered robots. 
And so over here, I'm just showing you a few examples. So to collect data, we just use a, a region grabber stick, like the one on the left, with a GoPro on it. So you move around, you show a demonstration. You do the same self-supervised learning plus nearest neighbors, and you can solve a bunch of different tasks, like opening drawers, opening cabinets. You can move in 60 space, right? So the action space is in full 60, so you can actually rotate and go and pick things up. And it works quite well. And more recently, we are also seeing a bunch of uh, a bunch of evidence of other groups also using it. So here, this is a fun um, cloud benchmark where the way it works. So it's, it's called Toto. The way it works is they have a robot, and you give them a policy, they will evaluate the policy and give you back the results. And they had an initial test where this nearest neighbor uh, approach called Win it does really well, and on one of the benchmarks actually wins the benchmark. It does not work well when the test object locations are not having overlap with the train object location. So if you, if you change the objects, it works fine. But if you move the objects to a point which is not seen before, it cannot extrapolate uh, spatially. So that's why this is zero, okay. and this is very low. Okay, okay. so then uh, there's this amazing iManual setup called um, Aloha from Stanford Folk. And again, over here, if you use the nearest neighbor algorithm, when uh, it's a very strong baseline and actually comes close to the transformer architectures they propose. And more recently, just a week ago, there was this uh, fun, fun setup where they used this exoskeleton to collect data. And again, if you use Win, which is over here, you get like the highest numbers on uh, on a bunch of metrics. Okay, so this is it's pretty amazing for me to see this because. This is like a super simple algorithm. Anyone can easily run it, and it actually works quite well. OK, so any questions so far? OK, so I'm going to hour ahead. Let's see how much time I have. OK, so uh, up till now, for all the imitation learning I've shown you, you have a task. I give you expert data for the task. It's unimodal, so there's only one way of solving the task. And we are able to fit models on this um, on this data. So now I'm going to give you a small example where where things break down quite spectacular. So here is a data set where there is an obstacle, and there is a user which has who has been asked to go to go around the obstacle without specifying how to go around the obstacle. So you'll see a bunch of data where you go on the top, a bunch of data where you go um, on the bottom. And you have these sort of two modes of data. One mode is in blue, one mode is in red. And I train behavior cloning, or most of the algorithms I've shown you so far. And you'll see a behavior of this sort. Where you start from the left, you'll go towards the goal. And right when you meet the point where the two modes split, you have, so in your training data, you have some examples saying go left, some examples saying go right. So the best way to minimize mean square error, if you're giving one answer, is to say zero, don't move at all. And so you'll see these, these uh, a lot of these models just stop when it has this, when it has a junction. Okay. So if you're playing PC, you've probably uh, seen seen this behavior before. Okay, so how do you solve this? Uh, how can we sort of learn models that can sort of use all of this multimodal data? So the answer is to sort of do two things. The first thing is we want to use as much of these transformer architectures as possible because transformer models, uh, if, you have, if you have used them, you'll see that they are actually able to, to capture a lot of multimodal information. Right? If I give it the same prompt, it will give me different answers um, as out. But at the same time, they, they usually work for classification problems. They, only, they usually work when you have a discrete output token. So a question over here is how do you use these transformers along with a robotics problem where you need to have high precision at the output. So here's what we came up with. It's called a behavior transformer. And the way it works is the output, which is your action, is normally in a continuous space. So the first thing you do is you discretize it into a discrete space. It's a simple k-means clustering. It will give you all these discrete bins. You store the centers of, of, of each of these bins. Now, of course, you don't want to lose, lose the precision. So what you also do is you also save the action offsets. So when you know the bin, you also know how far away it is from the bin center. So now for every action, for every continuous action, I'm going to view this as having two parts. 
one, a cluster center, and then an offset from the cluster center. Okay. And now from this, I can have a transform model where it, it does its multimodal prediction on that cluster center bin. So that's where it has a discrete token. It can, it can sort of model all the multimodality over there. But at the same time, for each of these cluster center bins, it's also going to output what is the continuous offset from that bin. So you get this matrix of this sort. Now, in output time, when you have to evaluate this model, you sample the bin. So let's say I sample this bin, bin number two. Now for this bin, I can find what was the offset, add the offset onto the cluster center, and just apply that action. Right? So it's a sort of tricky way of using um, a transformer to both give you multimodal outputs and have like a precision. You don't want it to just output just, uh, just a cluster center. OK, so we try this out, and we compare it with a bunch of generated models from Flow to VAEs, IBC, uh, energy models, all of that stuff, and across a bunch of benchmarks from driving to manipulation and like a kitchen environment. Uh, so these are all simulated environments. We get very high performance. Uh, but of course, this is a robotics seminar, so where is the robot? So, the first thing to do on the robot, if you have to do this, is you need to have a multimodal data set. So how do we get a multimodal data set? Well, you find a very motivated undergrad <laughs> and, tell, and tell them that to join the lab, they have to collect data. And so uh, I wrote this to a student, and they literally spent five hours that day trying to collect data. And so you will see this like long sequence of data uh, that this wonderful student collected and then trained models on. Uh, and so you can imagine this, like there's a kitchen setup, and there's, there's just like a student playing around with it, moving things around, opening doors, so on and so forth. So imagine this long sequence of robot data for like four and a half hours. Now what you can do with this is you can put a conditional transformer on it. So what this means is, okay, you have this large data set over here, this long sequence. Now I'm going to take two things. I'm going to take some observations at one time step. So this is observations at some time step. I'm also going to take some observations at a future time step, within maybe let's say 20 or like between 20 to 100 steps from there. So I have two sort of subsequences from this. And now from this current and future subsequences, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to predict what are the sequences of actions to take me from where I am right now to where I should be in the future. Right? And I'm going to do this prediction using the behavior transformer uh, architecture I've shown. OK, so it's, it's quite simple to train. You take arbitrary subsequences, train this model. And with this, you can do something quite interesting. So now let's say I have this robot, and I wanted to, let's say, open the oven. All I have to do is take an image of an open oven, feed it as a target, and then from its initial configuration, it will go and open the oven. Right? So I don't have to train, train to solve this task. It already, it's already seen this in its data, so it can sort of retrieve this experience and just solve it. Okay? Now if I have to move the pot, again, I don't, I'm not training it to solve this task. I just showed an image of the steel pot being inside the sink rather than being on the stub. And the robot will go, it'll, you know, it'll pick up the pot and go into the sink and drop. Now you can do something even more complex. Let's say you want to do two things. You want to open the microwave and the oven. So now again, I'm only showing you that image uh, as a target. And now from its input, which are these images, it will go to the microwave, open it, do something weird in between, and then open the oven. Okay. So you will notice, okay, let me just play this video again. So I wanted it to only open the microwave and the oven, but it instead also, it also rotated that in between. It's like a very classic large language model. You ask for something, it gives you an answer along with other stuff you don't want. Um, which, is, which, is, which is exactly what we see here. And after all, hypothesis is because in the play data, when we are not showing it the sequences as a sequence over here, right? So maybe the sequence where we have opened the microwave and the uh, and then the oven had this turning of knob in between. Right? 
and we never said to not turn them off. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, how much data do you think that you could have? Uh, this is around five hours of data. So yeah, one and a half of my stamps. <coughs> so it's collected at 30 hertz. So you can multiply that. Uh, but during training time, we do not feed the data at like. We don't use the full 30 hertz data. We do a sub sampling and then feed it. Because the problem with doing things at full high, uh, at full 30 hertz is that the actions become really small, and then when your actions are small, there are there are like issues in training these uh, these and so on. Like you have to scale it up. And, and what's your controller? Is it operating space control? This is uh, joint control. Oh. Yeah, but so how, how did they actually tell you operating? So so we have like oh. Great question. We have again like a VR like setup, and we use like the dongles. Over here. This is this is actually using a sort of older setup in the lab. It's, it's like a HTC Vive setup, and so you have like these two dongles. And yeah. So you so record the joint samples, and then you solve the with joint control. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. What would happen if you feed an image that has a target state but no robot? That's a great question. We haven't tried it out. It's something which we are doing right now, where we're trying to see if. In the in the target, what happens if it's just from arbitrary like first person data, or is it like third person data of a human doing something? Are we able to still get this type of models? Something which we are actively looking at right now. My guess is that right now it's not uh, because our representations like when in, when there's a human in the scene, those representations are really far away from from the representations when you have a robot. Alright, I still have some time, so I had three lessons, but I have a special fourth lesson. So here's my my third lesson where again we have to embrace multimodality, but in the data distribution as well. Because the data we get is not always going to be curated for the task at hand. So it's easier and cheaper to get uncurated data. So trying to create machine learning models that can learn from the data is going to be really important. Alright, so now for, for everything we do so far, we have a data set, we train the model, and then we deploy the model. But how good your, your data was and your model is, eventually it's going to fail. Right? If you're doing deployment, if you're having a machine learning model uh, and you don't have guarantees on it, it is going to fail. Right? So we see a bunch of failures on our robots. So on the top is an example of a hand trying to rotate this, this object and it falls down. And on, on the bottom is our robot trained to open the door, but then we sort of mask out all the key features, like the, the name trash on the trash can, and now it cannot open the door anymore, uh, even though the handle still exists. And then, in general, right, when you're creating a, uh, a robot, there's unintended consequences, uh, and it fails. Right? <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so, so when, when things fail, you need ways in which a robot can actually adapt and learn from these failures, um, and so that's what we're going to do, go over next. Okay, so the key idea is that these same representations, which we have been using right now as input into the policy, we are going to start using them as reward signals or guidance as well. The idea is quite simple. So let's say I have an expert behavior on the top, I'm flipping a bagel, um, and then my agent, after trying to imitate this, fails for some reason. Right, so it's not able to flip the bagel. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to take these two videos, encode them. Now since they are videos, which is a sequence of images, you will get two sequences or two trajectories of encoding. Now when I have these two trajectories of encoding, I, I want to know how far, I'm, how far the agent is from the expert. So to do this, uh, we can sort of find points and then match these points. We, we use an optimal transport matching algorithm over here to find out what's the best way to sort of transport uh, the mass from one trajectory to the other one. And we use this as a measure of how far are we, right? And once we have this measure of how far we are, we can use that, we can use that as a reward signal. So if the match is close, we'll have high reward. If the match is bad, we'll get low reward. And then we feed this reward into the agent, and we tell the agent, OK, try to get me as high rewards or as good of a match to the expert uh, to the expert trick. OK, so we have this algorithm. I won't go into the details of this algorithm, but it uses model-free RL on top of this to re-optimize uh, re the policy. OK, 
Okay, so the whole principle is that as it keeps improving, as the match incre increases, this trajectory should go closer and closer uh, to what the experts show you. Okay, so in all of the examples I'm going to show you over here, I gave the I gave the robot one minute of human data. So I show it one minute of data, which is between one to three demonstrations. And then what I do is I move the object around and I give the I give the robot up to 20 minutes to learn how to solve a task. So here's an example on the hand where there's a bunch of tasks like trying to slide and pick up a dollar bill, trying to flip a cube, trying to open uh, open the cap of um, of the bottle. So again, we use, so in this work we use uh, only vision, which is why the cap of the bottle uh, needs to have this multicolored thing so it can actually know uh, how much the, how much the bottle cap. Uh, it also works on our mobile Hello Stretch robot. So if you want to do things like uh, open a cabinet, open a drawer, switch off the lights, uh, assuming you don't have Google and stuff, but you can you can you can sort of use use the robot for uh, for a bunch of tasks over here. You can also do things on a more industrial grade robot. Do things like inserting keys into keyholes, flipping a bagel, um, and doing some other more um, precise tasks. Okay, but again, what is really interesting to me is is the generalization uh, aspect. So over here, I'm showing it one demonstration uh, or one minute of demonstrations to um, to pick up the bill. So this is a one dollar bill, and now in under twenty minutes of online training, it can figure out how to pick up a bunch of things like you know other bills, cards, credit cards. You know other things which are sort of uh, slide and pickable. Of course, it doesn't work all the time. Uh, it does not work if the object is too large, because it, um, our fingers it doesn't have enough of torque to slide heavy objects. Okay, so, he, so here is another example. Okay, we have a bagel flipping task. Okay, why are we doing bagels? Because we're in New York. But now let's say you don't like you don't like a bagel and you want to flip a different object like a croissant or a piece of bread. You can again re-optimize this policy and uh, adapt it in order to give to this new object. Okay, so all of um, all of these algorithms are all public. We have two versions of this uh, of this algorithm. They work in different cases, uh, and you know they're all online. If you're interested, feel free to use it. Um, and if you have issues using it, please please let me know. And this brings me to my final lesson, which is we should never stop learning. If you can create algorithms where even in deployment, once it fails, it does not repeat that failure mode. I think that's where we want to go as we try to bring these robots into the real world. Okay, so here are the four lessons, three plus one, where you have interfacing, we have focus on interfacing, uh, embracing multimodality of inputs, so um, multimodality of different uh, Senses, focus on how we can learn from uncreated data, and finally learn on the fly. And of course, all this work is done by amazing students. With that, I will uh, end and take the questions. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions.
Yeah, there are a bunch of things we are we are looking at right now. Um, so one of the main, one of the largest efforts right now is we're trying to see how these work in actual homes. So if I bring a robot in, in, into your home and I ask you to solve the task, how fast can it learn it? What are the error modes? Like, you know, when you run experiments in your lab, there are many things which you which you just don't notice. For example, recently we saw that um, sunlight is not a problem, but the shadows created by sunlight is a big problem. And so that is something which you would never know inside our dark lab. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just like trying to go up, go closer to the real world will um, so you know when we do that we'll sort of rediscover or uh, find a new problem that we haven't seen before while we I think that's, that, that's one of the main things. Yeah. Uh, perhaps there's more of a philosophical question because I don't want to come with information. But for the earlier part of your talk where you're talking about learning missing policies for your stuff, um, the, the bottle opener, for example, humans would naturally do that with two hands. We consider extensions to be just two robot hands and like splitting the task across them. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think we should, yeah, I think at some point we should use it. Um, so the way I like to think about it is if you're trying to, if I'm trying to sell you a robot, and if I can sell you a robot for half the price because it has half the number of arms, uh, you would first want to have that type, of, that type of robot, right? And I think when we think about scaling, right, so a lot of the machine learning push is in scaling. Have lots of data, fill it in, no, and then use it to train large models. Uh, having, like, trying to find what's the cheapest way to get large amounts of data is going to be crucial over here. So I think if you want to solve industrial level tasks for that, you should for sure use two arms because, you know, because you you actually need it over there. You cannot solve it using only one. But I think if you're trying to create something which can go out into the world right now and try to get as much data for as less of, less of a price, I think you have to start thinking more about, like more about the practical aspect, right? Like if you have two arms, it's going to feel twice as likely. Right? So it has to be in the best twice, twice as much, and it's twice as more expensive, right? So, so yeah, so maybe that, that maybe uh, might answer your question a little bit. Yes? Kind of a more philosophical version of that question. Uh, suppose you know you're, you're building a cheap robot. You decide that you know um, you're going to build one with <coughs> fingers and a suction cup or something like that. Yeah. Um, is there still a role for imitation learning? Can humans learn to train these robots, or are those situations where um, some of the other approaches, of, uh, either going directly from training or directly from physics? Um, might have a greater role than they do with these very um, kind of uh, human-like uh, robots or, or, or robot parts. Yeah, so I think there's like a philosophical question here and there's also like a very practical question. So, um, so for example, if you think about a company which does a lot of fulfillment, like Amazon, they have, a but they still have a bunch of humans on the floor where they have like a box and they take, you know, they see the order, it comes on the screen, they see, okay, you know, like a banana, for instance, okay? and they pick a banana and they put it in um, in a box, and then there's someone back in the box. So why is a robot not doing that? It's because humans are super fast and flexible at doing it, right? So even though you have um, a suction cup which can which can move really fast to the object and move down really fast, once you grab the object, it then has to move really slow, right? So just the the mode in which you operate. When a human is manipulating versus when a suction, uh, a suction cup or a robot gripper um, is operating, humans operate at much more dynamic, agile speeds. That um, that you know, even even though you may have same number of same amount of success rate, the speed actually starts to play a, a huge issue. So now, if you're trying to match that. It might be easier to start by seeing how humans, like just model how humans um, are picking up objects and transfer that. Now, of course, there are some cases where it's very hard to even have humans in the setup, right? So maybe there's something which is uh, sort of very dangerous. Maybe the work hours are too long. And for that, you really need to have a robot. And now I think um, if you already have a good solution, I think then the role of humans is in sort of like error 
correction mode, right? Because again, machines will fail all the time, and once they fail, uh, normally there's a human who comes and resets, you know, redoes everything. And in this process, if you can ask them to get more data of, you know, what should the robot have done instead, this can be then used in the sort of imitation or like, you know, online learning uh, works. Hopefully that answers, sort of answers the question. Uh, it might be out of time, I should have done other events there. So uh, okay. we'll only add the social later on, so thank you for asking questions. Then. Out of time again.